Hello and welcome to season three of the Elite Endurance Podcast. As you can tell, if you're watching from home, we are in a studio this time. The audio quality, if you're listening, is probably a lot better than what it has been. And that is really thanks to my new partner in this venture is St. Mary's Endurance Performance Center. So St. Mary's Endurance Performance Center is pretty much one of the best universities in Britain where you can really push on your athletics. So whether you're a long distance runner, middle distance runner, this performance center really has a great history in showcasing some of the best athletes. So the likes of Stephen Scullion's trained here, Adele Tracy, Jake Whiteman even trains here himself, uh, even though he was a university student at Loughborough University. So the whole point of this podcast and this collaboration is so I can really help showcase what a university experience is like in England. So on this first couple of episodes, we're going to get the coaches on. We're going to really sit down and dive into their performances, as them as athletes, and then also now and uh, the athletes that they've trained. These coaches have trained Olympians, world championship contenders, and just like all round professional athletes. So it's going to be really interesting to get an insight into their lives as coaches and also the elite lives of the students that have come through this system. We're also really going to like to focus on up and coming athletes who perhaps are looking to really like push on this year. Um, and it's really going to be great to see and get an insight into everyone that goes through this program. So without further ado, we're joined by Craig Winrow, one of the St. Mary's Endurance Performance Centre coaches, and we're going to be chatting about his journey into running and his experiences as a coach. Today, we're joined by a very special guest, coach at St. Mary's EPC, the Endurance Performance Centre, Craig Winrow, who's also an Olympian in the 800 metres. Welcome to the show. Thank you, George. That's all right. Let's um, with it. So, to get into it first, yeah. I think everyone needs to know a bit of like your history in running. So, how did you first get into running? Uh, I think it's probably just following the same path as most of us do. Um, sports days, I uh, used to do very well in school. Um, parents picked up on that. And um, just, I think when I was about 12, I think it was, um, they came to me and said, do you want to go down to local athletic club? Um, and I said, yeah, let's give it a go. Uh, first went to... I think it was Liverpool Harriers, I think. Um, went there, kind of didn't particularly enjoy the experience, so it kind of didn't go back. Mm. And then a couple of weeks later, um, parents said, well, should we go try Wigan Harriers? Because they were both pretty much the same distance from where, where we live. Um, so I said, okay, we'll, we'll go, we'll go. And I sort of enjoyed the first experience with them. Uh, and I started off as a, as a sprinter uh, for the first year. And then just by kind of accident uh, that one of my club mates at one of the um, Young Athlete League uh, couldn't do the 800 and it was a guy called uh, Paul Burgess and uh, he'd won, I think he'd won the English schools that year I think it was um, and I did the 800, didn't like it at all, um, I was sick all over the place after afterwards, I think I ran 210 for my first one and I think it would have been 13 I think um, anyways it's kind of made me think after that and uh, and then I decided uh, uh, to change uh, change group and um, and go and train with a guy called Chris Butler and his group and Paul Burgess was one of the, one of them people in that group so then that that following sort of six months of going through winter and, and all the rest of it um, uh, the following year did my first English schools uh, won that in 19. 86 I think it was um, and broke the English school's record uh, that year and it kind of just went on from from there really that uh, I started to be a middle distance runner. Yeah so like, like you said at the age of 14 you ended up shatter shattering the Lancashire County record as well mm -hmm. running 201 um, but then literally the year after by the age of 15 you were run running 151. Mm -hmm. How much of talent played into that and was it more just that you switched groups and we were ch training with the um, like the more 800 specific workouts? Was that kind of how, how it worked or is there an, like an essence of talent as well, of course? Um, 
Yeah, it's a combination, isn't it? It's, yeah. uh, it's talent, you know, at a young age, um, you know, sometimes we see this through through the past uh, results of English schools that uh, uh, people winning medals, um, it's being done off a lot of talent because uh, the training is not that hard at that age and I don't think it should be, uh, it should be fun. Um, and I think just the focus wasn't doing a lot of volume, but just doing enough uh, to allow me to show that talent really over 800 yeah. um, and it just snowballed quite quickly uh, into you know winning this English schools the following year uh, second at the English schools again uh, to Paul Burgess but then won the under 20 champs uh, and then went on was that that second year and then the third year I, I won it again um, and then I think that year I also went went on to uh, win the European Juniors in mm. 1989. Um, yeah. So it was talent, obviously. Uh, I, I believe I did work quite hard uh, in what I was being given to train. Uh, I wouldn't say it, so it was a lot of volume, uh, but it was a lot of quality and um, also kind of a lot of uh, S&C and plyometrics and stuff like that that we did at uh, a young age um, and that got me to a you know a certain level as a junior um, you know 147 uh, European junior champ um, also went won a medal at the world juniors in the relay four by four um, so I was you know I was fairly quick um, and then it kind of then got on to a point where okay I've done this as a junior and this is you know it, it's pretty good but how am I going to make that next sort of step yeah. um, and I made made the decision then I think it was 19 to um, change change coaches um, and move to uh, Norman Norman Poole uh, up in Manchester uh, who was quite a renowned uh, coach over middle distance and and then for about four years um, I was up and down and kind of struggled uh, some of it was illness some of it was a bit of injury and it took me four years before I actually made um, a senior team. Um, so there was difficult times in them four years of whether do I want to carry on, do I not, and all that sort of stuff. But luckily I stuck with it. And uh, the winter of 93, 94, uh, I didn't really have any problems. And, and then all of a sudden that allowed me to pop back out as a senior athlete and make my first uh, senior team, which would have been European indoors, I think, mm -hmm. in uh, 94. That didn't go very well, didn't get out of the heat. Uh, so obviously I had to learn that kind of experience. Uh, and then um, going into that summer, I just seemed to be kind of on a roll and running PB after PB. I won the British champs, uh, made the European champs, came sixth there uh, and did the Commonwealth Games and came fourth at the Commonwealth Games. So that was uh, a brilliant year. Yeah, and I, I think it's quite interesting that you, you had this lull in your career. And I know that The Guardian had kind of hyped you up um, in an article saying you were like one of the most mm. exciting new talents on, on the scene. How in much in terms of it, was it just consistency that really helped you move on? Yeah. Um, and when you were struggling with, in that lull period, was like, like you said, you were kind of considering dropping out. What do you think you would have done? if you were to have dropped out and not continued in your running career? Oh gosh, I don't know actually, because that's, <laughs> a, it's a, that's a tricky one because yeah. I didn't go, um, wasn't very academic. Uh, so uh, that side of things didn't interest me, didn't uh, go to university until actually after, after uh, I retired. Uh, I guess we'll go into that a little bit later. Yeah. Um, um, I'm not sure because I, I wasn't, I wasn't interested in anything yeah. else. Um, I was just, you know, fortunate to, to go into the sport and rapidly become successful in my age groups um, and that's all I kind of wanted to do um, so that I guess that's what kept me kept me going uh, just knowing that actually um, all this potentially might be is about me getting some consistent training in yeah. um, I know and we you know I say this a lot to some of my athletes that uh, have you know difficulties with injuries when they first come to university and then they you know having uh, problems and I just you know keep telling them to just try and keep the faith we just need to uh, get some consistent training and then that'll allow you to actually show what what your ability is yeah so if you were to speak to an athlete that perhaps is going through a lull and they really want to push on, let, let's say it's a listener at home who's kind of like the semi-pro level and they want to be making these teams. Mm. But 
they're obviously going through this period where it's, it's tough. Like, what would you say to them? <sighs> just, just keep positive about it. Really, that's yeah. that's the main thing. Um, if if you've already shown the ability to maybe get to that level, not everybody can, uh, and that's uh, that's being realistic. Um, but if a combination of uh, the basic talent uh, and if, if they've got some of them elements to the particular event that they're trying to do, um, then it is, it is about consistent training. Um, but, you know, I've, I see it a lot um, between that age of people coming to university at 18 uh, and obviously adapting to that situation. Um, and they take a few, it potentially might take a, a, a few, few years. Um, I think Tom Randolph is potentially a good example of that. Um, he comes in as, I think, a, maybe a 153 runner. Uh, while he was in uni, um, there was ups and downs with uh, a bit of injury and various other issues, and he's just kept at it. He obviously had some talent, and um, over the last couple of years, it's um, he's eventually got consistent training, and it's coming out of him. So Yeah, yeah, and is, I, I guess it's... The amount of like pros that I've talked to and they just kind of appear on the scene and they, they just say, oh, I just kind of enjoyed running and yeah. it just kind of went on from there. When you were so much younger, were you ever surprised by the performances that you were having or did you just have that faith in yourself like already? I think because it's, cause it happened so quickly in terms of that change in event and I, was su I had success you know, pretty much straight away yeah. by winning that first English schools um, and breaking a record and actually funny enough it's actually just been broken this, this year so that would have been 35, 36 years ago or something yeah. like that. Um, I think because I got that success straight away it kind of and it carried on through all my juniors and uh, and um, and obviously I won the European juniors. So it kind of obviously I, I must have had something that was was good and I I enjoyed running um, and I enjoyed winning. Uh, that was a, a big big thing in that age age group. Um, part of that next step then into senior, um, I did. I did struggle for a little while because I was I was winning a lot of the things that I was doing in the age groups, and then all of a sudden you become a senior and ah, I'm not winning all the time. And that was, that, that was actually quite difficult to deal with at first. Um, and uh, I think sometimes you find even some of our top guys now, it's, um, you know, they're not winning every Diamond League and whatever. You've got to learn to be able to uh, lose a little bit um, and think about what you're doing and take the benefit of that particular race that you're, you're doing in the hope that it comes right at the major goal. If, um, hopefully for some people that's a, a championship. Yeah. What, what I find quite interesting is that when I was looking on your power of 10, there wasn't many cross country races. Mm -hmm. Was was that never, uh, you never, you never thought that cross country no. could have been your thing? Um, I decided pretty early on that uh, cross country wasn't, <clears throat> wasn't for me. Um, yeah. I just, uh, I did a few when I was younger and I, I think when I, I did one English schools cross country, I think, and uh, I might have been third at the Lancashire schools uh, that year around there. So I was running all right and I, I felt confident going into the English schools cross thinking, right, I'm going to do well, do well. And I think I finished 70th uh, and I just, my running style, my action uh, just didn't really suit cross country. So I just chose not to not to do that anymore. Uh, that doesn't mean you're not doing some volume running and running on grass or hills and all that sort of stuff. But um, it wasn't for me and I chose to do indoors instead. Yeah. So in terms of like being a coach for the 800 meters and well, mainly middle distance, um, obviously like you've coached Adele Tracy, Andrew Asagi. Um, what sort of volume do these 800 meter runners now to be able to compete at the top level mm. what do they need to be doing because obviously 815 now you've got like josh kerr he ran a half marathon earlier this year yeah. in like 63 minutes so what is this new style of training that you're having to adapt to um i wouldn't say it's uh, i wouldn't necessarily say it's new um it's it's for some of them, what I would say, pure 800 meter runners, uh, yeah. and they're not particularly even doing 15s much, um, is my experience with the likes of Andrew Asagi and uh, Tom Randolph, is it's not a lot of volume um, because they just pick up problems and um, probably won't like me saying this, but a little bit fragile. So you've got to be a little bit careful in terms of how you do that 
so you know where you can make some of that up is cross training um, so they might not be doing a lot of mileage uh, but the quality of the sessions that they're doing and obviously they're bringing something to the table that is um, a little bit special and that's the speed um, so that's one way of it being done but there's also is the other way so it depends on what type of athlete you think you've got in front of you uh, and and what they can potentially handle um, and there's no there's no one set we've obviously got the the obvious people in the past uh, that might have done it in slightly different ways some coming from more quality some coming from a volume of running um, it can be done both both ways um, mm. but the likes of Andrew and Tom they just they brought the speed to it um, so you know them going through you know 50 seconds for 400 was not a massive deal because they could run 46 uh, where a 1500 or somebody coming from the other direction might not be able to run that quick, but they've got the strength a little bit because of uh, the, their endurance. When you say not a lot of volume, mm. how much is too much and how much is too little? That's what you're always trying to work out. It's not something that I can say that, right, if somebody goes and does that, that's going to happen and whatever. It's, it's working with that individual and figure, figuring out. And, you know, when you coach somebody for quite, quite a while, um, you know, uh, the combination of the athlete and, and myself, um, we like to see if we can work it out ourselves. Yeah. Um, you know, nobody knows when you're going to get injured and you're not trying to get people injured. But the reality is sometimes are always, always on this fine line and um, it can just tip over now and again. And then you've got to learn from that experience and, and go, right, OK, maybe we've just got to do it in, uh, in a bit of a different, different way. Um, I think... Uh, as an example with with Andrew uh, in 2012, so he won a bronze medal in the world indoors in 2012. Um, he'd already been progressing year in and year out, sort of thing, getting, gradually getting quicker. He won that medal. Obviously, that gave him a load of uh, load of confidence. Uh, and I think I remember us sitting down at one point, uh, having a chat, and we looked uh, looked at his training from winning that medal to to the uh, Olympic final, and it averaged out. 20, 25 miles a week, and that included warm ups and stuff like that. Now, before everybody thinks, wow, well, 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 he was cross training alongside of that for his uh, for the endurance side of things, but um, because we were always dealing with little niggles here and there, we just had to focus on getting the quality out of what we did do uh, for him to allow, allow him to run uh, run that well and run that quick. Yeah, that's that is quite amazing. I think it, another great example, uh, ex student here, Elliot Giles. Mm -hmm. He pretty much cross trains most it's, of the week. And yeah, it, it, he's uh, he's been a bit similar through the years that uh, they've had to just be a bit bit careful. But again, it doesn't mean they're not training hard on other stuff to try and uh, get the endurance up. Um, yeah. And Tom Randolph does a bit of that. Um, um, and it's just working it out um, with with the athlete and seeing what type of person you've got in front of you. Yeah. So going back to your running career, it was pretty much a quite a wild ride from when you were about 14, 15 yeah. onwards. Um, I think there was a bit of a disappointment in like 1992 when you didn't make the Olympic team, yeah. uh, but you did make the Commonwealth Games team in 94. Yeah. Um, you ended up finishing fourth. That was probably one of your like biggest major championships and one of probably your best performances. Mm. How did that kind of give you the confidence going into Atlanta, the the following t two years on from that? Yeah, um, I mean, it was before the Commonwealth Games, they had the European champs uh, yeah. two, two or three weeks earlier. So actually, um, there was, it was a little bit more of a focus for that year on, on the Europeans and, and running well at the Europeans because we knew, obviously, Commonwealth's a um, couple of weeks later, uh, you know, who, how are you going to react? Are you going to be really, really tired and all the rest of it? So focus on that. And the Commonwealth's was a bit of a bonus. Um, so the Europeans was big step up for me in terms of that's my sort of second senior vest. And um, obviously we had the, the three rounds and, and going through the rounds and kind of getting more confident and more confident and we got, got in that final. Um, wasn't particularly happy with the way I ran that final. Um, I think I could have done a, tactics could have been a bit better. Uh, but again, I'm still learning at that stage, even though I've been running for so, so long, I just hadn't been at that level um, um, for like three or four years. Uh, so 
That was a brilliant experience. Uh, took that and then took that um, into the Commonwealth Games and just sort of like, I'm in, I'm in good shape. Um, I know I'm a bit mentally tired from doing the championships, but and then went through the rounds again and um, came out with a fourth fourth place. And sort of you know the odd times when I do watch it back, it's don't think I particularly did anything wrong. And that was where I was you know going to finish and I did as did as well as I could. Um, so that obviously that year was a great year for me and that allowed me then to go right okay uh you know how can i move this on a little bit for, uh, further uh didn't particularly uh run well in 95 that was the world champs um made some adjustments to my training um and started to do a bit more volume running myself but um i kind of kind of messed it up a little bit in the sense that i kind of left it a little bit late to change things into the kind of the 800 stuff um, and came out not particularly running well maybe 147s and, and stuff like that and I was like ah oh, didn't do well at the British champs didn't make the team so I kind of made a decision to sort of take myself away for 10 days two weeks and just just really just focus on the quality and get back on and then I came back out and started running 146 again so it was like okay I'm going to have to learn a bit of a lesson here, uh, and then took that into into '96, and obviously again had the consistency of the winter, which allowed me to uh, to perform and um, get on that Olympic team. Uh, still, kind of a, a, a an up and down with that because I'd gone into the British Champs as, as favourite. I'd run consistent PBs going into it, and I just uh, I built. I built it up and built it up and built it up and then by the time I actually got to that final at the British Champs I was drained, I drained myself because I just kept saying to myself right I just need to get in the top two, I'm going to the Olympics, just need to get in the top two and I kind of kept repeating and repeating itself and I just felt drained in the final and didn't run particularly well so um, took that that evening, I remember taking that evening, I was like so upset with myself and mad with myself because no, you know, nobody else's fault it was my fault that uh, I created that and just kind of let go a little bit and then luckily in the next couple of weeks um, there was still an opportunity to make the Olympics and did what I needed to do and um, I got selected. Yeah so in the in the British Champs final where, where did you end, actually end up coming? I think it might have been six or seven for something like that. Yeah yeah so and like, like you said you had to take yourself away and kind of think more about like probably you're running but also yourself and like the pressure you put on yourself yeah how kind of did you let yourself kind of let loose a bit and um, not be too like i just think i think about that far but i think i remember that night i probably had a little cry with myself uh and just realized that i'd done it to myself that i'd built mm. this pressure up and and it didn't need to be like that because i I was obviously running well, um, and I was running PB, so just just go and do it. Uh, but I did did let it get to me. Um, so I just said, right, I've just got to let, I've just almost just let myself go a little bit, and just get back to, right, what, why do you do this? You do this because you enjoy it. You you enjoy racing and all the rest of it, and uh, seemed to seem to work for me. Um, and then I had the the rest of the year was pretty good. Yeah, and I think that's like. Because you've had these experiences at that level, it obviously makes you such a great coach um, in terms of being able to kind of, if someone is, I, I know with my coach Mick, if I do put times on things and stuff, it does get to that point where I'm being way too like precious about mm. kind of wanting to do well. And instead of remembering that obviously to do well, you gotta have fun. Definitely, yeah. I've, not, I've not come across an athlete that's at that level that's doing really well that is not is not having fun with exactly. it, um, and they're relaxed about it. Of course, you know they'll be nervous and they'll feel the pressure and all the rest of it. That's part of uh, part of the sport. Um, but it's just finding it's finding your own way how to deal with some of that pressure and and you know I do tell a lot of my athletes because obviously they do come come to me all the time with well you know what time should we do for this session or what time should I be hitting and you know what what time should I do this in a race and and you know you'll probably find if you speak to a lot of them that I just say just 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 run and just race and race people and if you're racing well and you're getting in top threes 
the times the times will come. Um, there is the other side to that that if obviously you do get to a level where it's you know you're trying to make a championships and obviously with uh, um, selection policies and all the rest of it that there is sometimes pressure on um, having to run them times because you're not going to go anywhere if you don't run a qualifying time. Uh, so there there is some two sides, but you've got to try and if you're in shape and you know you're in shape and you're a bit of confidence, you just got to bide your time and hopefully it comes out in the races that you do. Yeah, and we'll definitely talk about the selection policies in a bit, but let's go slightly back uh, to Atlanta. You've you've made it to the Olympics. Yeah. You get through the heats. You're in the semi-finals. Um, Unfortunately, you didn't progress to the finals. What do you think happened there? And obviously, it, for, for England, like you said, like you have been a favourite for quite some time to do really well, mm. um, especially after the, the fourth at the Commonwealth Games. So what, what kind of happened? Do you think it was another um, pressurised situation? No, or? no uh, not with Olympics, because I, I, I made sure I told myself that I'm going to, go there and really enjoy the uh, the experience and um ran really well in the heat um and i was i was quite realistic with myself i didn't i didn't think i was going to make the final i was not at that level at uh, that top level that people that uh, going into there were running 43s and 44s and stuff like that so uh i i wasn't i wasn't running them times um but i wanted to run Room come away from the semi final and running, running well, um, and then just unfortunately tried to put it aside. But woke up on the semi final and, and my body was just aching, and I just felt awful. Um, and I was just like, Right, okay, well, there's nothing you can do about it, just uh, uh, try and put it to the side and, and go through your normal process. So you warm up and going out there, and just didn't really deliver anything. So I was, I was pretty frustrated with that, and uh, you know. Looking back and experience of obviously coaching now for years and gone to various champs and all the rest of it I probably looking back I prob my, my recovery was probably not good enough and it wasn't um, like we do now with some of some of my athletes and about trying to recover between rounds and Maybe it was just I was just a bit dehydrated and obviously we were at Atlanta. It was hot and um, That's all I can kind of put it down to because you know, if it had come away and come fourth or fifth and ran 145 or something like that, I'd have been happy. Now, this was me, I think, maybe coming last in 147, 148, which was not good. Not good at yeah. all. Not at a championship. That's, that's the last thing you want to happen is uh, at a championship you run like that. Yeah, so since then, if you were kind of still an athlete now, um, but you were in the future, and you've got the access to better technology for recovery and the better shoes. Obviously, you've got the, the super spike that yeah. kind of uh, with a carbon plate and stuff. Do you think you would still be running 145s or do you reckon you could get lower than that? I mean, it's always a, it's always a funny one, this, isn't it? When, yeah. we, when we laugh, I'll, I'll have a laugh with the athletes on, on that because uh, Randolph has uh, run quicker quicker than me now but I always have a laugh well you've got the super spikes on though haven't you so uh now who, who no, knows it'd be it would be interesting to know we do know they have an effect uh would that allow me to run 144 probably I think it would have done and if I'd have yeah I've had a better look at how I was looking after myself in recovery and diet and all that and all them things that we have a bit more of a focus on now uh probably would have been better but I still I still wasn't the 142 runner and that's what you needed to do to win a medal at that, that Olympics. Yeah and what's quite interesting is that your times, I, I looked at the world, the world championship uh, final for the 800 meter, your times are kind of similar, I mean they're, they're kind of, they have like more 144 runners um, in that final but do you ever think like you, it's quite interesting to see that your times are still kind of up there with some really good runners that are racing. Um, I mean, when you when you look at, I guess, our current crop of 800 runners, um, it's not really. It's like, you know, I only ran 45, 6. I'm not, you know, saying that's uh, rubbish as such, but um, it's, uh, I mean, I wouldn't even be making the team off that because the qualifying time is, is a lot quicker. Uh, so I wouldn't even be on the team now. Uh, so... 
it, it's it's hard. You can't. It's difficult. You can't compare sort of uh, thirty years ago to to today and how it's how it's being done and maybe different, slightly different training methods um, and and all the access to the facilities that you have nowadays. So obviously, one of the quite big. Um, talking points of the year, um, especially leading into the world champs in Britain, is the selection policy kind of drama slash controversy that basically British athletics have turned around and said that they only really want to send people that are going to medal mm -hmm. um, and they don't want them there just to make up the numbers. What sh how do you kind of find that? Obviously, you've, you've been an athlete for Britain. Um, would you say that perhaps the selection policy is good. Um, it, it has shown evidence that we are getting medals, um, especially at World Champs. It's probably one of our most successful World Champs in quite a while. Or would you say that the athlete needs an experience in order to be able to then progress and then get the medals? Yeah, when, um, when the decision came out about uh, that selection policy, um, uh, I'm not going to lie, I'm not happy about it. Um, I expressed that view where I needed to express that view. Um, I feel that if, um, you know, with, with World Athletics has changed the way uh, they want to um, make up their events. And, and that is half of the field potentially coming from uh, the qualifying time and, and then half of the field coming from world, world rankings. Um, I, yeah, I, I'm not particularly happy. I think if people had earned the right uh, on world ranking points and got an invite from uh, World Athletics, I feel that that should have been accepted. Um, yes, we had a great champs. Um, obviously, I was there and watched a lot of it, um, and, and that was good to see so many uh, athletes do well. But you know, particularly in endurance as well. Um, but it didn't massively in the end ultimately affect um, the team in terms of who, who was selected in sort of some of the middle distance um, events. But if, for instance, um, obviously we had London Diamond League uh, and the men's 800, um, if it hadn't gone the way that it had gone um, and them guys have run the qualifying, so Ben, um, you know, Ben might not have been picked. And um, that would have been frustrating to see because obviously Ben had been running well in all the events. I think he wasn't outside the top three in every event that he did this year. Um, he just hadn't run the time up to the uh, London Diamond League. And if he hadn't have done it there, then he potentially wasn't going to be, well, he wasn't going to be on the team. And then look what happened. He's won a medal. Uh, so I, I do think it's, yeah, I think it's a bit short-sighted. And um, if people have earned the right to be uh, invited or they've, they've automatically qualified themselves, then I think we should be taking as many people on teams as possible. Yeah, and I think I think it kind of goes to show as you go up the distance, we didn't send anyone in the 10K, we didn't yeah. send any steeplechase runners. Um, would you say the times are a bit more harsh for British athletes? Because I know there's a, a time adjustment as well. Um, so obviously, uh, for an example, I had Will Battersill on the show. Before he had the qualifying points to go, he got the invite and obviously he ended up uh, not being sent. Um, yes, he's not got the time that uh, is set out by World Athletics, but obviously being able to compete, if you go through the rounds and you actually somehow have a breakthrough of like PB, yeah. obviously, it's really hard to go out, run, run the PB time that you need, and then also go to the Olympics or the World Champs, and then also get that time again mm. or progress even further. So, in terms of that, like if an athlete like Ben is um, kind of shooting for those times, do you think that they should have more time to be able to get that qualifying time? Because I know, uh, for example the London Diamond League was the last event mm -hmm. that anyone could run mm. to actually get out to the world champs. So would you say that they need more time to be able to do it? Obviously, the Olympic qualifying time window has opened now. So I mean, it's, it's a window. You, 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 um, 
this is nothing to do with uh, you know British athletics. You know, there's a yeah. there's a de there's a deadline, uh, and that deadline is the same for anybody in the world. So, so the, the the bit is you know where that is, and it's it's a matter of trying to do it before before that deadline. Um, you know, sometimes the challenge is is um, you know are you getting in the right meets? Can you get in a meet that's being run that quick and and, and all all that type of stuff? So it, it's quite it's quite tough um, to pull that time off. That's fine. That time has been upped, and okay, uh, it, it, it is what it is. And hopefully, you know, they're getting half of the field f from people who have run run under them times. But then that is then about world the world rankings, and then uh, you know, you, you, your points over them, your best five races within that within that period. And if that puts you, I'm just trying to remember now the the numbers I might be wrong here, but if they want 56 in the 800 then if that puts you in the top 56 on the world rankings, then that's World Athletics deem that good enough. So why are we not taking people? Uh, yeah. I, I don't understand. And I know people say, well, it's not trying to make up numbers and um, um, all that type of stuff. And it's, sometimes I think we just need to step back and um, remember why we why we do this and why people train so hard and want to achieve uh, go to go to them achieves and if, if if that is somebody getting to olympics and they don't get out the first round but they've done everything to get that to that olympics and that's and that's all they ever do in their career well i'm sorry that's that's blimmin good um you know i look at my own experience and and um you know, I went to one Olympics. I hoping I was going to go to another one, but that didn't happen. And the, it's not. You know, I, I didn't just turn up at that Olympics thinking I'm just a, another number. Or I'm just here. I'm just here for the experience. No, I went there to try and do the best I can. And, and I don't believe any athlete that goes on the team is just, just being there for the experience. They're being there. They will get experience, but they're being there to do the best that they can. Yeah, and I think like a great case study is obviously Mo Farah. He competed at um, a few world championships and mm. Olympics before he started making up the medals. Like, yeah. it's just so it's a bit disheartening to be mm. a British like a, a follower of the like British athletes and stuff, and probably seeing that quite a lot of them, even though they're for, like phenomenal runners, especially you got Andy Butchart. Mm -hmm. He's now decided to target the marathon because it's probably more realistic that he'll get the time mm. rather than at, mm. at the 10K. Mm. And if you were to go to the night of 10Ks, the amount of guys that are getting low mm. 28s, um, mm. kind of high 27s, like we should be sending these guys because they're not just making up the numbers. They will progress into... Yeah. I mean, I think it's... I mean, obviously, if we, we, if we look at... Um, on the middle distance side, eight and fifteen, both men and men and women, obviously, you know, we're doing really well. Yeah, and um, um, we've got uh, a number of people. We're in, we're in a, an era where really, really top athletes are, are not making teams. Um, you know, if we just look at the the recent um, um, funding list that's just come out, you know, and there's uh, there's seven um, seven guys being funded for the fifteen hundred. Uh, and they deserve to be funded because they're all running exceptionally well. Um, but seven doesn't go into three medals, does it? So it, it's you know there's going to be four people uh, that's going to miss out of the Olympics next year. Uh, but we've at the moment, and there might be potentially be some more that come through. Then it's it's a good crop of seven people that you're talking about. That uh, if any one of these uh, seven are making that the Olympics, then the likelihood is they're going to do well at the Olympics. Yeah, and in terms of the middle distance scene, the 1500 is yeah. pretty much like blowing the doors off both in the men's and the women's. Yeah, yeah. Um, this year at the World Championships, your own athlete, Adele Tracy, mm -hmm. um, she ran the 800s um, and also the 1500, mm -hmm. breaking the Jamaican national record mm -hmm. and getting to the final in the 800s, coming, I think, top seven in the world. Uh, yeah, she was yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah, so... In terms of that, how much does it excite you going into Paris? Obviously, Adele um, now runs for Jamaica. She used to run for Britain. Uh, but so in terms of that, are you changing anything to kind of progress her on? Or are you, are you kind of trying to say, you know what, we did really well this year. We're just going to carry on. Plug it, plug in away, and just see what happens. Um, we've had a good sit sit down, uh, end of season kind of sit down. I had a chat about the season, not a lot to uh, um, complain about. Uh, she's just had <laughs> the course, best, yeah. best year of uh, her life, and um, 
um, we talk through things about how you know what we've done, what's slightly changed, how you know how we turned up at the World Champs, and she's in the best shape of her life, and uh, that's great as a coach to be able to help somebody do that. Um, and yeah, we've we've chatted about right. Do we change anything? Do we look to add anything? Do we do a bit more volume? Um, and I think that will kind of slightly unfold as the year goes year goes on. At this point, at the moment, we're just getting back into winter training, so that build up is just happening, and then we'll get to that stage, and then there'll be a little bit of right. Do we need to do a bit more? Um, and what is that more? Uh, the, the the questions that we both need to kind of answer um you've you know you've got a few little ideas is that a bigger volume of sessions is um does the snc increase is it more mileage all them questions and sometimes the answer might be no actually um even because you sometimes you always feel like you have to do more um but is it maybe about just strengthening the areas up that have been working well yeah and as her coach obviously you've got quite a close relationship you went out to Budapest, you were able to watch her mm. in the 1500 and in the 800. What was it like to see her smash that national record and also come, well, she got a PB in the final. Mm -hmm. uh, I think she PB'd in the semi, in the well. semi as well. So yeah. these PBs were just coming like almost every day as she was yeah. racing. Like, how did you make sure to keep your call and her call like going yeah, into the um, stages? You know, luckily I had accreditation to be in the in the warm up um, area with her. Um, but actually, at that point, there's not a lot that we do. We, um, you know, we will we'll chat the day before about uh, the race, um, and you'll find out what heat you're in and who you're racing against and all them type of things. And we'll have that initial chat. But during during warm up, I, I I'm just there. Uh, just uh, she wants to have a chat. She has a chat. She's got a process. She's got that down to a T in terms of uh, how she does that. Um, and you know, the final bit, I might just walk in, walk her to the call room. Um, and uh, it's as simple as, yeah, good luck. Um, and, you know, do, do the things that uh, you need to do in the race. Uh, and that's it. And then, you, you know, you go and watch it. Yeah. Uh, and it was just a brilliant week, you know, as a coach for somebody that, you know, I've coached Adele for 10, 10 years. Uh, and we have a, you know, really close relationship. And, you know, she's been chipping away and done champs before and all the rest of it and got to semi-finals and all them sort of things so to to see that week unfold the way, way it is i mean if there was something we were looking back we you know we weren't disappointed because it's hard to be disappointed in terms of a 358 in the in the semi and a jamaican record um but obviously we just missed out on the on the final we didn't get um we didn't get in the top six uh now that was that was one of them because that's that's a change that's happened this year in terms of the 15 that um there's no no uh, fastest loser spots anymore um and then ironically that would have been a fastest loser spot yeah. from previous championships so she would have been but hey it is what it is i actually quite like the idea of the top six actually uh it's pretty simple you know what you need to do and that's that's what you're, you're aiming to do so so 15 was was brilliant and for her to you know to to run on the 358 um you know in pretty much her second year at 1500 now um so that was really good and then for her to go to then go through the rounds of the eights um was was just just brilliant because really um our focus was the 15 um, so the fact that we, she's in a position to be able to double because she's running for Jamaica, um, no, we do it, and obviously she went and made the final on two PB. So uh, brilliant year, uh, brilliant week, sorry for me uh, and for her, obviously, uh, and just to sh just to see how she how she dealt with it all, and and she loved every minute of it and loved every step of it, and uh, and that's what you want to see from an athlete. Yeah, there's so many videos of her like in the mix zone getting interviews yeah. with and she, there's, she's just smiling ear to ear yeah. in every single yeah. interview. Yeah. And actually, to be honest, whenever I see her training, sometimes I always, it always made me laugh. Like we were doing the hill session the other day and I was running down and she was running up. And 
I'm not sure if it was a grimace, but there was a there was still a smile there as she was running. I think uh, her, her, uh, her smile is a grimace. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so when she's working hard, it just yeah. happens uh, to look like it's uh, she's smiling. But uh, nah, she 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 uh, loves the sport. She loves loves running, uh, and um, it's just good to see when you get an athlete to that level that they actually come away from that champs having done what they wanted and got, yeah. got out of it. And obviously, St Mary's Endurance Performance Centre has been pretty much her home yeah. for her whole career. Yeah. How, in terms of that process of her coming to St Mary's, being a student athlete, and then obviously transitioning into being a full-time athlete now, how has the Endurance Performance Centre benefited her? Mm. Um, obviously, you've been coaching her, like you said, for the better part of 10 years now. So you've seen her kind yeah. of grow as an athlete. Mm. What was the kind of the way in which the St Mary's itself supported her? Yeah, so um, she'd uh, done a degree. I might get this wrong, Adele. Uh, but yeah, she did a, um, a degree at Bour Bournemouth first. Um, and then she decided that she was going to come and uh, do a sports science degree at St Mary's. Um, so obviously... Uh, I started to coach her then, um, and that was, uh, I can't remember off the top of my head, she might have run 204 or something like that, um, around that. So so you start to build that relationship and she starts to trust uh, what I want her to do. Uh, and then obviously that just, you know, that that's progressed and she gradually started to make, make some teams. Um, uh, and then that whole process, obviously, of being St Mary's because of the setup that we have here, um, it just supports them individuals coming in um, and just introduce them to different things and show, showing them uh, gradually the way how to be a professional athlete um, and use what we have here uh, to their advantage. Uh, and obviously a big part of it is is the training groups that we have, isn't it? And um, um, because we've got some good good training groups and the environment we are, we're around here for running with the parks, um, then that was the initial idea of what what uh, um, the Endurance Centre wanted to be, was that to get groups of uh, talented individuals together, um, show them what they need to do, and hopefully uh, the ones that have got that next bit we'll discover it and obviously we've in the in the past we've done pretty good at that um and we keep we keep doing it um so uh i think that's the biggest thing and she's she's created her, her own environment around here she lives around here uh, she's got a brilliant setup um and it, it works well for her um, and obviously she's fortunate of being a full-time athlete that uh, she goes to altitude two, three, four times a year. Um, and this is, her, this is her base. Yeah, and I think that that's one of the biggest things that St Mary's kind of offers as uh, for student athletes and also athletes is that it just has a great atmosphere. Mm -hmm. There's people always around to be able to train with, but the facilities are great. Mm -hmm. They're not massive like Loughborough, no, but... No. They work, and I think, especially with the PEC, with the um, yeah, the I think it's called the Performance Endurance Center, maybe or something like that. Performance Education Education Center. Education center. Yeah. Um, we have the facilities to be able to offer yeah. the yeah. A, everyone yeah. a, a chance to improve, like via S and C, but also just running with better people that are better than you. I, I've been humbled many a time in a session now that you then start to see that progression mm. a, as an athlete, and so. If you're if you're listening, um, definitely come come down to an open day and, and check mm. it out because it's definitely worth. Uh, if you're kind of thinking of, we always we have one of, of uh, you know a few options in the country that's got a, an endurance program uh, ourselves, uh, Birmingham, Loughborough, Leeds. Um, other places as well, so I'm not uh, leaving anybody else. There is other places. Sorry for not listed you. Um, and then obviously, you know, there's a bunch of athletes that are going over to to America. Um, so there's lots of options. We are one of them, um, and obviously, you know, we're welcome anybody at whatever level that they think they're at, or they don't think they're it's good enough. They're good enough. Then you don't know whether you're good enough until you uh, come to one of these envir environments and give it a go. Yeah, and so like in terms of your coaching career, you did a stint out in the US that mm -hmm. you just mentioned. Um, that obviously that's an option for some athletes. So you went out there, yeah. and that's where you kind of began 
uh, your career as a coach. Mm. What was that transitional phase like for you when you kind of finished the Olympics? You've done that. I think you you ran a few, a couple of years after that. I think your last race on power of 10 is 1998. Yeah. So what happened in kind yeah. of 98? That so sort of obviously after the 96 Olympics, um, um, I was raring to go. I was, you know, really happy. Made Olympics, right? You know, I'm 24. I think I would have been, um, and I was, yeah, I was looking forward to um, the next four years um, and the next Olympics. And um, just unfortunately, I, I, you know, throughout my career, I had Achilles issues, and um, yeah, just basically flared up. And in the end, in 1998. I decided that that they needed to get an operation on my uh, on my Achilles, more Achilles if you want to call it Achilles. It was more like bursitis, but around that area. But this was on both both feet, so um, I got the operations, had them, and just fortunate that that summer, uh, my, you know, my old my, one of my best friends and my one of my uh, big rivals, Paul Burgess, we were. Um, uh, Living, living together and training. There's a couple of us. We had a house that uh, we're training, and a, an old friend of ours who um, uh, had gone to the states when he was 18 uh, on a scholarship. He was home home for the summer, and he made contact, and we started hanging out a little bit. So I just had these operations, and then he said, "Oh, why don't you come out? Uh, you know, I, I'm coaching out in the states um, at McNeese uh, University in Louisiana." He said, oh, why don't you come out for a few months because it's nice warm weather and diddle of this. So it's kind of said, not a bad idea. So I decided, uh, decided to do that to try and get back into, into my running. Uh, things, Achilles, especially my right one, was just didn't seem, seem right. And uh, I was there for a few months. And then just one day, uh, the head coach at the university uh, came up to me and said, um, would, you like a, would you like a job coaching? And uh, so it just put me in this situation where, oh, right, okay, why has that been put in front of me? And, and I knew Achilles didn't seem to be getting any better. Uh, I obviously, if I wanted to continue to run, I, I, you know, I wanted to get to the next level. Uh, and, and I knew for me to be able to do that, I was going to have to train even harder. And I just got to a point where I thought, well, my body's not going to let me do this. Um, so... I took the opportunity up and uh, yeah, went over there and started coaching um, and um, was there for, for six years. My initial bit of what I did coaching wise is I just give everybody what I used to do, um, but rapidly realized, wait a minute, that took me years to get to that point. Why am I giving these people the same as what I was, yeah. I was doing at that, uh, in them good years sort of thing. Uh, so I had to kind of step back and then start to think about, oh no, right, okay, I've got to, you know, build and develop individuals. And that's kind of where I served so my apprenticeship, if you want to call it in that sense. And then I was fortunate when I came back to, to England that uh, I got the offer, the job down here. Yeah, so obviously that's crazy. Um, but did you ever race, have you ever raced since 98 at all? No. No. I've never particularly even run properly since then yeah. uh, just because of my Achilles my Achilles is still my right one is still messed up now uh, so I have no no opportunity of running unfortunately uh -huh. <laughs> which, which is this is sad uh, um, you know I'd love to be able to just go out and do like three 30 minute runs a week or something like that but uh, unfortunately my body won't let me do it yeah and so I think I think that kind of really wraps up what I wanted to talk about. Um, we've kind of obviously talked about the way that you've developed into a coach now, and obviously you were taken quite um, aback when you realized that actually you've got to be able to develop athletes um, from kind of the ground up and mm. stuff like that, um, instead of just prescribing them workouts. In terms of being a coach, how has that helped you still stay in touch with the sport? Of course, like, it was it's pretty much been your life since the age of yeah. kind of 14 and 15 for you to be able to see people like andrew sarji compete at, at london 2012 mm. and adele most recently and then you've obviously got other people that kind of mm. jump in with your sessions like jack rowe mm -hmm. who he trains 
um, obviously not with you, but he sometimes yeah. comes and trains here. Like, as a coach, how proud does that make you to be able to kind of see your athletes do so well? I mean, it's brilliant, isn't it? I mean, because I've been because I've been fortunate to uh, um, you know go from athlete to coach, and and I'm been fortunate to be paid to to do my job, um, but. You know that enjoyment that I get get out of athletes getting. Well, when I say it, this, I, I enjoy it just as much as somebody that's run a PB at Watford than it has. You know, somebody doing something at a, thing, at a major championship. Obviously, the major championships is it's a big, big, big thing, and you're really proud of being being involved and being part of that process for that individual. Um, and obviously, you know, I, I sit there and when them things happen. I, you know, have to remind myself I've been part of that. I've helped that individual get to to that level. Um, and uh, yeah, uh, you know, uh, some of my older athletes like your Ross Murray and Andrew Asagi, and and just going through that process as coach and athlete, and um, and then to the other side out of that, that uh, you know, uh, they're some of my best friends now as well. Um, and to just go through that process with with an athlete and their career is uh, is brilliant. Yeah, definitely. So I think that leads us really well onto the no context track section of this. <laughs> so I previously showed you a photo. Anyone who's watching online, um, I'll flash the photo up on the screen now. Mm -hmm. But can you just describe? Uh, you're looking quite moody in this photo. Moody. Yeah. Um, here it is. Let me put, my, gla have put my glasses on. What is the story behind this photo? What's Where the story? How I would love to look like that again and have her. <laughs> um, I think, if I remember, uh, that would have been 94. Uh, Sheffield, um, I can't remember what they would have called them back then. Kind of a Diamond League, but it wasn't a Diamond League, but it was a big, it was a big meet. Um, and that was after the Commonwealth Games. I think that was my last race of the year. And absolutely shattered and ran awful. Oh, fair enough. <laughs> <laughs> no, no wonder why you look at Moody on the start line. You're probably burnt out. From I was just, yeah, I think yeah. I was just burned out. Uh, I think if I remember, oh, actually, it wasn't my last race. It was the one that I came after Commonwealth's, um, mm. and it was first, so probably it was only back maybe three or four days or something like that from Commonwealth's, and obviously that was in Canada. Did that, ran rubbish, um, and then we still had the... Uh, the World Cup at Crystal Palace uh, in '94, and I knew I was just I was I was shattered because obviously two championships it does take it out of you uh, mentally sort of thing. So I was a bit shattered going into it, and I was like, oh, I just don't know how I'm going to do here. And then somehow I had a I had a great great run, and um, I was I ended up being third. I was second with about 60 or 70 meters to go um, with the Olympic champion William Tanui from. 92 coming coming past me and um and i always i always remember when he did come past me because back then it was like oh i've just lost four thousand dollars there because he's just come past me so i think you know it's gutted it's gutted but no nah, i'm glad i finished with that one because I, I ended up uh, sort of finishing off my year and like you know what what a great year yeah there might have been a couple of uh, rubbish races in there but overall it was a good year yeah i mean fourth at the commonwealth and then mm. third at the the mm. world cup so yeah yeah it's yeah. pretty pretty astounding year so here we go we we're on to the final question of the show <laughs> what's the funniest story you have from running uh, obviously you've been in the running space for many years now mm. so it can be from racing training or your coaching life um I guess a, a, a funny, a funny one was doing a international. It might have been like an under twenty-three, maybe international for for. Um, it might have been England then, not not uh, Britain. Um, I can't remember. We were in Poland or something like that, and it was two per team. And the um, uh, the other English guys was Paul Burgess, who was like I said, a friend and a kind of a an arch rival when we when we were juniors, and. Um, we did this race and obviously we were really good friends and, and uh, we were a bit cocky back then, I guess. Uh, and we both kind of, we both, like before the race, we both said to each other, um, right, right, if we come off the bend, then we're like one and two. And we know we were one and two, like with about 50, 60 meters to go. Let's, uh, 
let's start waving to the crowd like down the down the whole straight. So come off the bend. Uh, I think uh, Paul was inside of me and I'm on the outside and he looks across. And we're both like feeling good. It's like, yeah, this is all right. And he goes, right, come on, let's do it. So next minute we start waving to the crowd and doing all this. Next minute, I think this Czech or Polish guy comes to me. <laughs> and oh, no. So you can imagine what uh, team management was saying to us afterwards. They weren't... Uh, weren't particularly happy yeah perhaps you showboated slightly <laughs> too early too yeah yeah. <laughs> yeah so the final question is it's very rogue mm -hmm. very off topic it can be anyone don't have to be to like anyone in running at all it can be literally just someone that you look up to but if you're stranded on a desert island and you were to live out your final days yeah um, with anyone whether they be factual or fictional yeah throughout history who would it be and why and it can't be Bear grills, No. And it can't be a member of your family. Okay. Everybody's going to have a laugh at this when they see this one. Uh, it, it, it would be, uh, it would probably George Michael. Right. So I could be sitting to uh, his album, uh, Listen Without Prejudice, because it's my best album that I, I like listening to if I'm up, down or whatever. I might put that album on. It'd probably be him. Cool. It'd have to be a stage so he could get up on stage. Yeah. And what 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 kind of era is this? Is this like eighties George Michael? Uh, no, it'd have been nineties, wouldn't it? Early, yeah, okay. I think early nineties. Early nineties George Michael, yeah. and you're going to set up a stage <laughs> yeah. on this desert island, <laughs> yeah. have him perform for you. Yeah, and you just chill, yeah. chill there on the beach. There you go. Yeah, fair enough. Maybe you need to cut that one out, George. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's going up there. Anyway, thank you so much for joining me on the no, Elite thanks for having us. podcast, and for everyone at home. Please make sure to like, subscribe, share with your friends and uh, we'll see you next week for another Elite Endurance podcast.